Morning, Hope. A special welcome to all of you who are either in this room or, well, that's a special welcome to everybody, I guess, or those who are online or at one of our local sites or one of our mission partners in Pennsylvania or Maryland or in Denmark or in Africa. Uh, it's really good to uh, be together with all of you today. Starting a new sermon series called Seven Habits of Highly Effective Christians. And I want to start by talking about crowds. You'll notice one thing as you read through the Gospels of the New Testament that there were large crowds wherever Jesus seemed to go. And it wasn't because Jesus was following the crowds. It's because the crowds were following Jesus. The Bible says in several places that he fed thousands of people with just a little bit of food. In the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, we read about 3,000 people being baptized, big crowds. In the Gospels as well, it says at one point, which seems like even more than 3,000 or 5,000, the crowds were so big that Jesus literally had no earth, no, no land to stand on. He had to get in a boat to get away from the crowds that were pressing in against him and that, literally pushing him into the water. Jesus wasn't following them. He wasn't trying to bring it to them. He was, he was realizing and experiencing that they were following him. And they were following him for a good reason, because what the world had to give them wasn't enough. And they were starting to realize, like we all do at some point in life, that following the crowd isn't going to necessarily get us to where we want to go, even though it might seem so appealing. Or we start thinking, we're, we're so discerning, we can follow the parts of the crowd that are good and, and not follow the parts of the crowd that are not so good. But then even when we follow the parts of the crowd that seem so appealing, that seem so alluring... It seemed like they're going to reward us and get us to where we want to go in life. It just seems so good. And then even if, we, even if we succeed, even if we get there, it isn't enough. What's the biggest crowd you've ever been a part of? I was at the Indianapolis 500 a few years ago, and this is not a picture I took, but that was about my view from where I was sitting up in the grandstands. There were about 350 to 400,000 people there that day, it was estimated all in the same stadium. It's almost twice the population of the city of Des Moines. Every, every single person who's here, that from, from the middle of turn three and four, the top of the track that you see on the screen here to the beginning of turn one, that's about a mile. There's another mile and a half on the back side of the track. This massive sea of humanity, it was, it was overwhelming. It took my breath away. And then I remember there was another time it was actually in a bigger crowd. It was at a, an event called Taste of Chicago in the 1980s. And, they stopped doing this because the crowds were getting so big. There were estimated one million people in the crowd that day to see the fireworks at Taste of Chicago. And if you're wondering where we got the idea for Taste of Hope, it's right there, Taste of Chicago. <laughs> we'll get some food, we'll get some people here, we'll have an open house, we'll get people to get a taste of the good things God is doing at Hope. Well, Taste of Chicago was that same kind of thing. You could stand in line for about three and a half hours and get one rib. Uh, from, from some restaurant, and he was like, oh, this is awesome, and there's a billion of us here doing this, and this is great, but the fireworks were great. There's just something ab about big crowds that can bring energy and, and inspiration, but as we think about those crowds, let's ask the question, the deeper question, which is the first of seven habits of highly effective Christians. Are you following the crowd, or are you following Jesus? Because highly effective Christians follow Jesus, not the crowd, when they're going in different ways, even in slightly different ways, that will follow Jesus and, and not the crowd. There's a movie that came out, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago now. It's amazing how fast time flies. An animated movie called Wally, which gave us a glimpse of what's going to happen if we keep following the crowd. Specifically, even before screens were as big of a deal as they are now, I read somewhere, who knows the validity of this, but I read somewhere this week in preparation for the sermon that the average American spends 11 hours a day looking at screens, our phones and laptops. 11 hours a day. For a lot of us, it's the first thing we grab, it's the last thing we let go of every day. And have you ever noticed that you'll be sitting around with a friend or a family member, and you maybe bring up a particular brand of an automobile, a car, and within a minute, all of a sudden, there's an ad for that exact car on your phone? Coincidence? Oh, I think not. I think they hear you. I think there's no doubt about it. It, it just happens way too often for it to just be some sort of random occurrence. You say, well, that's a little creepy. Thanks for telling me that, Pastor. I'm so glad I came to church. I'm not here to freak you out about social media or anything like that. I'm just asking you, 
do we want to give everything we've got to that? Our, our, do, you do realize, right, that on social media, and again, I'm not here to attack it, but, but as we scroll through that they learn, their AI, their bots, whatever it is, learn what it is that keeps you on their platform longer, and then they bombard you with that. If you're on the political left, you're going to get bombarded with all sorts of things from the political left to the point where you're going to think everybody agrees with me. If you're on the political right, you're going to get bombarded with things that are just about the political right to the point where you're going to think everybody agrees with me. And we're all against them. And over there, say everybody agrees with me. We're all against them. And the world is further divided, and none of us have the truth because we're only getting one side of the story. We're not getting the whole truth. The truth that Jesus says in the Gospel of John would set you free. Are we going to follow the crowd in everything we do? Is our goal going to be to be like everybody else, to conform, to, to try to copy the patterns and behaviors of this world, which is the way the verse is written in our Bible reading for today from Romans 12? Do not copy, the Bible says. Do not conform to the patterns and behaviors of this world. But instead, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn God's will for your life, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. Then you'll know a truth, and that truth will set you free. In this movie, Wally, it gave us a glimpse of what's going to happen if we just continue to conform. Keep in mind, this was a movie that came out 15 or 20 years ago, and I'm not saying that this is what we've become. I mean, you can't imagine that a company would become so big that you could just push a couple of buttons on a screen and they would deliver the product to you within a day or two, just like that. I mean, that'd be ridiculous. Or that the owner of this company would build a rocket ship and think that maybe that's the hope of the future of, of humanity, and maybe it is, I don't know, but that he would build a rocket ship and then he would call it Axiom. Just remember that name, Axiom, as you watch this clip. And remember, this clip was made 10 years before this business owner named his rocket ship. And more importantly, take a look at what our world will become if we just continue to conform. I have it all morning, so let's oh. hover over to the driving range and hit a few virtual balls Woo. in space. Nah, we did that yesterday. I don't want to do that. Well, then what do you want to do? I don't know. Something. Wow. Make a place green. No, it doesn't sound Look, I'm tired of so it. We'll it. Way. Way. If you can't fold the straw, it's not yet so it any good. But, over here. <laughs> Whoa. Sweet home. B is for by and large, your very best friend. Mm, time for lunch. In a cup. <laughs> Feel beautiful. It's the new year. Oh, stunning. Great. I know, honey. Men. Attention, Axiom Shockers. Try blue. It's the new red. Ooh. <laughs> I notice a lot of you are wearing blue. Some of you are totally out of date wearing red. You need to catch up, according to that. A bit. Although, I think later in the movie, they switch back from blue to red and back and forth. and back. Maybe they go orange or something, green along the way. Are you following the crowd? OK, where is it going to take us? Am I following the crowd? Where, where is it going to take me? What, what, what's going to be the end result of this? Just giving my heart, soul, mind, and strength to the patterns and behaviors of this world. Trying to, how, how important is trying to fit into you? Trying to find that flow and going with the flow instead of being like the salmon in Alaska that swim upstream in a downstream world. My wife and I uh, were on vacation a couple weeks ago and we went to Alaska, first, first time since I was two years old. So it was like you know, 25 years ago and it's been a long time since I've been there. And <laughs> That's not, that was a lie, I'm sorry. I'm not going to tell you how old I am anymore, but there's a, 
There, there, was, there was a part of it where we actually saw salmon swimming literally upstream while all the other fish are going downstream. And another day we were, we were out in the ocean and we're watching the salmon hop out of the water. Have you seen this? Have you been to Alaska to see it? The salmon, they, I mean, I've heard about this before, but I'd never seen it. And you'll be sitting there on the boat and all of a sudden the salmon's and back in the water. Well, they actually don't say, but that, in my mind, that's what I'd be saying if I was a salmon jumping up out of the water like, hey, I'm not like a trout, look what I can do. I, I can flip out over the water and, and do all these things. And there was a, um, a guide, a, a guy who definitely knows his stuff about sea life, and he says, you know why they're doing that? And I said, no, why, the, why? I mean, they're not swimming upstream right now, this isn't what they're made for. They, they, they should just be saving their energy for swimming upstream when it's time to go a month from now. He says, well, no, they're working out. They're building up their fish muscles. Did you know fish had muscles? They're, they're building up, they're, they're getting fit for the journey they were created to, to live out, to, to swim upstream in, in downstream world so they can get where they were created to go by their creator. In order to understand Romans 12, we have to understand Romans 1 to 11. Romans 12 has this key verse for today. The first and most important of seven habits of highly effective Christians. Stop following the crowd. Follow Jesus. In Romans chapter 1 to 11, though, Paul lays out this glorious, deep theological treatise. It doesn't get any deeper than this anywhere in literature. And he says, this is God, this is you, this is how this relationship works, this is how you get saved, this is how you have hope, this is how you have a life, and this is the first 11 chapters are the theology, how we understand God. Starting in chapter 12, which is where we start reading today, stop following the crowd, follow Jesus, that's the first thing Paul says about, since this is God, this is you, and this is how the relationship works, therefore, this is how you should live. Number one, most importantly, stop following the crowd because the crowd's going the wrong way. The crowd's swimming downstream. You were made for more than this, Salmon. You were made to jump out of the water. We saw other glorious things in Alaska. We saw a, a whale come up out of the water. That was amazing. Sally was looking forward to that the whole time and she was super stoked about it. In fact, I did take a video of her when we saw the whale. Uh, let's take a look at that real quick. Yeah, that was our boat, not the fanciest cruise ship. <laughs> we can't afford what you people do. Don't worry, Sally's okay. She, she's fine, she's, she's right over there. She's, she has to, to steal a line from another comedy movie, she's skinny, but she's strong. She, she handled it just fine. That wasn't Sally. But we did see a whale come up out of the water, not quite that dramatically, but it was amazing. We saw mountains, we saw sea otters, we saw bald eagles. The first bald eagle we saw, we're like, oh, bald eagle, wow, get a picture, get a picture, get a picture, get a video, oh, this is the video. And then the 343rd bald eagle we saw, <laughs> we're like, man, there's a lot of bald eagles here in Alaska. <laughs> Same thing with waterfalls in these mountains. I, I mean, with all due respect to those of you from Texas, and I get it, in the lower 48, you know, everything's bigger in Texas. Until you visit Alaska, the mountains are bigger, the ocean is bigger, the waterfalls are bigger, everything's bigger. The first waterfall we saw, we're like, wow, that's amazing. The, the 3,000th waterfall we saw that same day, we're like, okay, there's a lot of waterfalls in Alaska. But then you pause and you realize, God, just how good are you? How glorious are you? How majestic are you? What kind of an artist are you? that you could make all of this and that you could coordinate it in such a way that there's life. And then we read, not just at the beginning of Romans 1 to 11 to understand Romans 12, but all the way back to Genesis 1, that God made all these things and you, and you start to realize, even if you didn't believe God made all these things, you start to see the art and it begs for an artist. You see a painting that just can't randomly happen and you say, well, there has to be a painter. You see creation 
like you do untouched. For the most part in Alaska, you're like, there is most definitely a creator. There's no way this all comes together. Like, and I get the glaciers, but that's the way God cuts it. That's the way God moves it. That, that, that God is, that, that you can't just say, oh, well, the paint just randomly got on this oil painting in just the right colors and just the right sequence so that it's, it's a masterpiece. It's a da Vinci. It's, it's a Michelangelo. It's, it, it's glorious. No, there's an artist. When you see the art, you say, well, the artist had to be great. And so Paul says, in order to understand what the transformational life is going to look like and how we can get there, and it's way easier than you think. I'm not here to give you a guilt trip and say, oh, you've been following the world too much. Stop following Jesus, you horrible people. What's wrong with you? It's what's wrong with us. It's our tendency to want to just go downstream with the world, to worship false idols. And I'll just put one of them up here, but it's certainly not the only one. Popularity, or it could be power, or to be an influencer, to be famous, or to have some sort of worldly status or to have some sort of level of worldly wealth. There's nothing wrong with those things until they become idols, until they become the things that we think, if I just get this stuff, then I'll be happy. And so I'll just, because the world's going that way, that's the way I'm going to go. So it's very tempting, and it is very alluring. And And we look at it and we say, yeah, but look at all these people who make, look at all these famous people. Look at all these professional athletes. Look at all these famous singers. That's what I want to be. You know, we say, all right, look at all these rich CEOs. Look, look, at, look at how well they're doing. Look at all the stuff they have. Look at all the things they can do. Look, look at that. That's the freedom. That's the life. That's where I want to be. Nothing wrong with that. Until we start to think that's where I need to be in order to be whole in order to be satisfied in order to be content that's not true that's conformity at its worst that's us thinking that we're getting somewhere but we're actually falling down a staircase into the darkness and it gets particularly obvious when it involves immorality we say well I need to get rich so I'm going to cut some corners find you know at work I'm going to cheat I'm going to do some things because I need the money I think I need the money, I don't. My family needs the money, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get involved in some deals that aren't ethical. I'm going to get involved in some, some business practices that aren't righteous, that aren't good. I, I'm going to go down that road, and I'm going to justify it because that's my idol. That's what I live for. And the crowd, everybody's doing it. I mean, I wouldn't be the only one. And so, I mean, if I don't do it, I'm not going to be able to keep up. I'm not going to be able to compete. See how we justify? It's, I got to go with the crowd. I got to swim downstream. Or we say my, my goal is pleasure. So I can, I can drink as much as I want. I can, I can, I can get drunk as much as I want. I, I, I can go out and, and step outside of my marriage and cheat. Because and, God wants me to be happy. And, and that person really understands me. That person really gets me. That person really meets my emotional needs. In a way, my spouse just doesn't. And so I justify it. So, so it's okay. And, and never mind the train wreck I'm going to leave behind. Or the lie I know I'm telling. And the effect that has on the relationship that I made vows before God that I would keep. So it's so easy to fall down this staircase of immorality. And Paul talks about that. He says, you, if that's you, you could be transformed too. And it starts by stop following the patterns of this world. Stop justifying sin. Re- know that God is not in the sin blessing business where we reduce Christianity to like, God, I know I've done a lot of bad things, but everybody does these bad things, and so would you just come and bless it? God does not bless sin. God's not going to bless our patterns of behavior that are worldly and, and, and are in, in contrast to us moving toward the light and being redeemed and being set free and knowing the truth. See, folks, Christianity at its core is about way more than just a philosophy of beliefs. It's about the experience of a radically transformed life. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. Let's read a couple of Greek words up here. The first one is coming up on your screen here. Let's read this. <laughs> Sorry. It's, I'm just going to keep telling that joke till I retire someday. Suske mati zeste. I have no idea. You're what's loose? Suske mati zeste means conformity. 
It only shows up twice in the whole Bible. Paul is really digging deep. He's finding a word that fits. Stop suske mate zeste in. Stop conforming. Stop copying the patterns and behaviors of this world. Instead, you'll know this word, even if you don't know Greek, metamorphous thing. Be the caterpillar that's transformed into the beautiful butterfly. Get your wings and your color and fly. That's what awaits you when you stop following the crowd. And you turn and you follow Jesus. Because Christianity is more than a set of beliefs and philosophies. Christianity is a radical experience of a transformed life. A complete change. If you didn't grow up in the 1970s, there was this comedian, his name is Steve Martin, before he was in Only Murders in the Building, way before. And he was the number one comedian in America, and he had the number one best-selling album, uh, music album even, uh, it was just comedy, stand-up, in, in America. He was it, he did Happy Feet, he did King Todd, he did Wild and Crazy Guy, and he did the Nonconformist Oath. Take a look, that's a good one. Follow along. Okay, good. Now, let's repeat the non-conformist oath. I promise to be different. I promise to be different. I promise to be unique. I promise to be unique. I promise not to repeat things other people say. Good. Okay. You'll get it on the way home. Did you notice the crowd just completely, they said, I promise not to repeat it. Oh, I'm doing it. <laughs> Do not conform to the patterns and behaviors of this world. Steve Martin picked up on it. Don't conform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's closer than you think. It's not as hard as you think. It's about making room for this Jesus to come all the way in. On the next screen, it says in Romans chapter 1, in order to understand Romans 12, we got to go to the beginning of Romans. They knew God, the people of this age, Paul's writing about, immoral people, people who are falling down the staircase, living for the wrong things, making idols out of otherwise neutral to, to good to bad things, but they make lousy gods. The people of this age, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him. Everyone say worship. Oh, you're conformist. Sorry, I won't do that again. I won't make you say anything today. They wouldn't worship him as God. Instead, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people. Not only is that prophetically creepy for the 21st century, but it's also a constant reminder that this has always been the way, that we make idols out of aspects of God's creation instead of worshiping God alone as the creator, as the artist, as the maker of us, and being reminded that of all the glorious things God has made, you the, and I, the human race, we're the highlight of God's creation. And so we worship our creator, not creation. We don't worship the whales and the mountains and the waterfalls, if we get it right. We worship the one who made them. We worship the artist. We worship the creator. We worship the God who loves us so much he sent his son to die for us. You have no excuse, even if you don't know God, Paul says, to the Romans, to the part of the Roman Empire that wasn't religious. He says, you have no excuse, because you can look at creation and you know there has to be a creator. But then... Be careful, because before we get in our self-righteous religious high horse, we turn the page to Romans 2, which also explains Romans 12, and we start to think, right, these people are doomed. These people are condemned to hell. These people are sinners. These people are immoral. We are working our way up the ladder to heaven because we're religious. We go to church on Sundays. We worship him. We do the right things, and indeed we do. This is worship. Next screen, please. <laughs> that was the cue. This is worship. This is truly the way to worship him. But it's not just what we do here on Sunday mornings. It is this, and this is essential, and this is commanded, and this isn't a take it or leave it kind of pro proposal in terms of God saying, this is how I wired you up. We need to do this every week. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Do not neglect the gathering together, the Bible says, of God's people and worshiping God together. But understand this too, Romans 12, 1 goes on to say, worship is what we do after we say, go in peace, serve the Lord. Not just what we do before we say that, during this time right here and right now. It's at the end of the service and after the service. And when you go home, and it's Sunday afternoon, and it's Sunday evening, and it's Monday morning, 
and it's Tuesday, and it's, it's every day of the week. It's every waking moment. This is truly the way we worship him, that we would see ourselves for what the Bible says we are, ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And so we put to the test everything that we might say. Does this sound like something Jesus would say? Am I following the crowd and sounding like the crowd? Or am I swimming upstream in a downstream world and sounding like Jesus? Does this seem to be something that Jesus would do? The Jesus revealed in scripture, not the convenient Jesus I make up? The Jesus who actually loved his enemies and commanded us to do the same? The Jesus who commanded us to turn the other cheek? The Jesus who commanded us, blessed are the peacemakers? The Jesus who commanded us and said the greatest commandment of all, the one that fulfills them all, is that you would love one another and not just your friends and not just the people you like? Do you know what one of the truest tests of the deepest Christian is? How many enemies do you love? How many people that are against you do you still love? Do you still have grace in your heart for? That's the deepest Christian. That's the one who's following Jesus, not the crowd. You say, oh, man. God doesn't really want me to love those people who've done all those terrible things to me. He doesn't want you to love what they did. You can hate that. But we can't start hating people. I know this is radical. I know this is upstream in a downstream world. I know a lot of Christians justify it, but that's not Christianity. I know they'll tell you it's Christianity. I know a lot of preachers will tell you that's Christianity. I know a lot of pastors these days will stand up and say, hey, you gotta hate, you gotta destroy, you gotta get the other side, you gotta, you gotta divide, you, you gotta win these battles. You, th- th- there's so much at stake here. Eternity's at stake here. Things that are not eternal are at stake and the things that we say are the most important things. Does it sound like something Jesus would say? Does it, does, does it, if you're going to take an action one way or another, does it seem like something Jesus would do? Then you're following Jesus. And just before we get all on our high horse, we have to remember just who Jesus calls us to be. On our uh, Alaska vacation, and by the way, is it warm in here or is it just me? It's warm. Hey, Gail, it's warm. Can you turn it down? Please, thank you. That would really help a lot. I'm not the only one. Uh, So it'll get cooler now soon. But I just wanted to get you a little fire and brimstone at the beginning. And now we'll bring in some fresh breezes and some fresh air. As we stop following the crowd that's going to lead us to you know where, instead we follow Jesus who's going to give us a breath of fresh air and like a cool breeze coming through the worship center. The highlight of the trip for Sally and me was Ketchikan. Maybe you've been on a cruise. Maybe you've been there. It's the first stop if you're going from Washington or Vancouver up to the north, but we started in Anchorage and we're working our way down, so it was the last stop before we came back down to Vancouver. Ketchikan was the highlight for me because this is where my parents grew up. I found my dad's house right here where he grew up. I found my mom's house, which just happened to be nine houses away on the same street. I did not know that. I found the church right behind the cruise ship here, First Lutheran Church, where they met and where their families worshipped. Here's another picture of that church. My dad was on the steeple one day because his his dad, my grandpa, was a building contractor and a house painter. And my dad was given the task by my grandpa, because my grandpa didn't want to go up there, of tiling the steeple. And it is super high. And it freaked me out to think of my dad at about 15 up there tiling that, that roof, that steeple. And as the story is told by my mom, while he was up there dangling from ropes, he sees his future mother-in-law, my grandma, my mom's mom, walking down the street. And he says, he was so extroverted and happy-go-lucky. He says, hey, Mrs. Danielson, how you doing? And my grandma said, you be careful up there, Tommy. This is my heritage. I, I never lived there. I, don't, I didn't go back because it's like, oh, I remember that. I don't remember any of it. But this is the church where they met. My mom says that the Danielsons, her family, that's why we named our son Daniel, because she was the last of the Danielsons, an only child. She and the Danielsons would sit in the second to back pew on the left side. 
which is always the most popular row in any Lutheran church. I notice it here today. We have a few open, not very many open seats in the whole room today, but at other services where it's less full, the back two rows are always full. You gotta get here early to get one of the back two rows. <laughs> the Danielsons would sit on this side, second to back row. The householders would sit on this side every Sunday, second to back row. And when my mom moved to Ketchikan, because her dad, my grandpa, was the new superintendent of the public schools there. She was asked to sing a solo a few weeks later. She has, this, she has a gift for music and this voice. And she's in fourth grade, maybe. And my dad was in fifth grade, and that's when they met. My dad heard her sing, and he went up to her afterwards. The legend has it, the story goes, but I heard it a million times. My dad said to her, you sing good and you have shiny legs. And then he ran away. And that was the beginning of a match made in heaven. This is before Alaska was a state in the pioneer days. And if they hadn't met, if my grandpa didn't get the superintendent job, if my other grandpa hadn't moved to Ketchikan in the middle of the Depression in order to find work, I wouldn't be here. It would be a different story being told today. But this is the story God wrote. And he's written stories for you too. And the problem is we're going to miss it if we keep following the crowd and think, I'm just born to be a caterpillar. Just a worm, basically. No, you were born to be a butterfly. You were born to have a metamorphosis. Have you had one? Have you experienced this spiritual transformation? You say, no, I must be doing something wrong. It's closer than you think. It's so simple. It's right before you. That's what the scriptures say. This word is near you. It's on your lips and it's in your heart. You don't have to do anything except make room. Just make room for this spirit to come. Because it's not just those who worship false gods as idols and, and fall into immorality. It's, it's religious people who think self-righteously, I, I'm going to get to God in heaven because I'm so great. But you turn the page from Romans 1 where Paul goes after the immoral people of this age to Romans 2 and he goes after the religious people. He said, you think you're any better? This is where Paul famously says, don't judge lest you be judged for the very same thing that you judge other people for. And then he goes on a rampage. He says, look, we're all sinners in need of a savior. We've all, we're all like sheep that have gone astray. We've all fallen short of the standard of God's law and what God has called us to be. Don't think that you're moving up closer to God, that you're getting points in heaven for this. Our hope for heaven comes from one place and one place alone, and it's the God who sends his son Jesus Christ into this world. The arrow is pointing down. God comes to get us. God comes to the rescue for us through the cross of Jesus Christ. Don't think that you stand right from God because you're, you call yourself a Jew or an Israelite or because you, you're a citizen of, a, of the nation of Israel or you're a descendant of Abraham or Sarah. Paul says you're not a true Jew because you were born of Jewish parents. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. A person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not people. A person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not people. What about us? In our day-to-day -day lives, who am I seeking praise from the most? You? Other people? Or God? What about you? When we seek the praise of God, it lines up our steps. It reminds us it's futile to think that I can get right with God by my patterns of moral behavior or my self-righteous religiosity. I'm not right with God because I'm Lutheran, because I'm Catholic, because I'm Methodist, because I'm Pentecostal, because I'm non-denominational, because I volunteer, because I'm an usher, because I'm a Sunday school teacher, because I'm in the choir. <laughs> The choir, <laughs> the choir sounds better than that, Be, because, I, because I serve in some other way, because I go on mission trips. I do those things because God has made me right with him. I do those things because God has set me free. I do those things because I'm a butterfly, not a caterpillar. I do those things because I've experienced transformation, not to earn my salvation, but because I'm saved. And so are you. 
Anybody who wants to receive God's grace, anybody who wants to stop following the crowd long enough to make room in your heart, your soul, your mind, to go all in, to worship God 24-7, not just on Sunday mornings, but all week long, to see yourself for who you are, an ambassador of Jesus Christ, to let his light shine to you and reflect off of you, a person with a changed heart. And so... The cross is the symbol of this victory, of this hope that we have. But what if I, ch- what, I don't mean changed it, but what if I just modified it a little bit? And you say, be careful there, this could get sacrilegious pretty quick. But I'm a really bad artist. Can you tell what I just drew? It's an anchor. Hebrews chapter 6 says this hope that we have, this hope not just for salvation in heaven someday, but this hope for being rescued from this futility. Do you feel it ever? I think if we're going to be honest, all of us go through seasons of life where we just feel numb or disillusioned or disappointed in ourselves or the world or both, frustrated beyond belief to the point where we're like, what's the point of all this? Have you been there? Are you there? Thanks be to God, here comes Jesus to the rescue. The same Paul writes in the same letter to the Romans, Romans 7, who's going to rescue us? Who's going to save us from this condition? Thanks be to God, here comes Jesus Christ. This is our hope. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. And so the anchor isn't just some sort of random verse that I'm putting up on this this whiteboard for you. It's actually the secret symbol of Christianity that was used more than a cross for the first two or three centuries of Christianity. The anchor and the fish. I know the Jesus fish gets made fun of a lot by Seinfeld and others. And it is a little funny. But the Jesus fish actually has a way deeper meaning, and it's going to be hard for you to laugh at it after this. The Greek word for fish in biblical times is ixthes. You take the first letter of each of the five letters for the Greek word for fish, and it's Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. Ixthes. And so one Christian would come along and wasn't sure if the person they were dealing with was a Christian and would would draw half a fish in the sand or the ground or the dirt of the ground and that other Christian would draw the other fish and be like, okay, I know I can trust you because you're living a transformed life because you've been changed because you know what it means to be a fish swimming upstream in a downstream world. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls and now here comes the really fun part. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary to find the life that your souls always long to live. To wake you up from the numbness, the futility, the frustration, the disappointment in yourself and in others and the world. Wake up. There was a Christian movie that came out called The Matrix. He said, oh, you're stretching it, calling that. It was very violent and dark. and It was violent and dark. But the guys who wrote it grew up in Sunday school in a Christian church and they took good notes. And they admitted, yeah, the first one, the sequel's not so much, but the first one is loaded with Christian metaphors. Neo, that's Neo, played by Keanu Reeves when he wasn't John Wink. Neo was was the hero to be in this movie, and his name means new, and he was stuck, numb, conformed, a caterpillar, lost in the matrix, controlled, couldn't get out, sensed that he was made for more, and so are you. But he had no freedom until God sent a prophet to him named Morpheus. And, it all, and Trinity, I mean, tr- come on, Trinity? Shows up and Trinity sends him a message that says, wake up, Neo. Wake up, Neo, you were made for more than this. And then in an important scene, not long after the movie starts, The prophet Morpheus comes to Neo and said, it's your choice. You can take the blue pill and go back to your life of conformity and stay numb and stay lost and keep wandering and get stuck and you might succeed and you might not, but it won't matter because you weren't made for that. Or you can discover what your creator created you for, what your maker made you for, the kind of art the artist made in you, the colors of your butterfly wings. You can learn how to fly 
The prophet Morpheus says to Neo in this scene, you can take the red pill, and all I'm promising you is the truth. And now that scripture verse rings a little deeper, doesn't it? If you continue in my word, Jesus says, you'll know the truth, and that truth will set you free in a way nothing less will do. Take a look and find yourself in this picture, this scene. The matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. <sighs> Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Follow anybody who will point you to Jesus. Stop following the ones who are pointing you to themselves, into their brand, into their whatever it is they want you to find life in. We will not find the life we were made to live apart from Jesus Christ. That's how God has created it. That's the created order of things. And the good news is, it's right in front of you. It's on your lips and it's in your heart. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know that teleon is the Greek word. And it means perfect. And this word doesn't show up much in the New Testament because perfect doesn't happen a whole lot this side of heaven. We know this. I mean perfect. No, you'll, you'll experience perfect even before you get to heaven because you'll be transformed. And you'll walk with a confidence that you won't find anywhere else. Because you'll know, even while all the other fish are going this way, I was made to go this way. I was made to be an ambassador for Jesus. I was made to be Christ-like. I was made to say the things he would say to people. And do the things he would do to people. And not do the things that he wouldn't do to people. Then you will know, once you're transformed, you'll know God's will for your life, which is good and pleasing and teleon, perfect, complete, fulfilled. Your soul will not be unsatisfied. It'll be full. It's like you got two pills before you. The conformity with this world, and then you do the best you can. And you try to find some victories along the way. And you live for the things the world says you need to live for in order to make it. Or you take the truth. And this truth will set you free. Oh, please, <laughs> choose wisely because there's a whole radically transformed new life over on the other side. When you stop following the crowd and you start following Jesus, this is the first and most important habit of highly effective Christians. We still got six more to go, so I'll see you next week. Let's stand up and together we'll give God praise. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for Service Online. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We don't think it's any accident that you're here and we have been praying for you. To see more of our content, know when we go live and stay up to date week to week, feel free to subscribe to this channel. And if you live close by one of our campuses or local sites, we invite you to check us out in person. We would love to meet you. And don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date.
See you next week.